now I'd like to start the program and introduce Don Nascar Nelson, who is going to give a talk on why the South lost the Civil War and why the North won. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Shelley. <laughs> Um, historians have started changing um, South to the Confederacy because it wasn't really the South that was fighting the war, it was a Confederacy that was fighting the war. The South is made up of slaveholders, non-slaveholders, and slaves. Um, and one of the main reasons the South lost the war, they didn't dress as well as we did. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, um, now there, um, in, in order in order to d take a look at at this, um, I gotta give you a, just a little bit of background here. Um, hostility between the North and South leading to the Civil War began in 1820 uh, with the passage of the Missouri Compromise. And even at that point, there was uh, hostility going on between the North and the South. And numerous events between uh, 1820 and um, uh, the war increased the intensity um, between the intensity of, of conflict between these two uh, uh, areas. Nullification crisis back in um, 1832. Um, a group of southern states decided that they had the right to nullify any federal law that the federal government made. And so um, they said, hey, if you make a law we don't like, we'll nullify it. It was in effect for one year, and then a compromise came along and they got rid of that. They could nullify certain things, but not all. The, anti, the American Anti-Slavery Society um, was uh, created in 1833 and that was the beginning of really the abolitionist movement and the recognition that there was really a great, a great uh, disparity between feelings towards slavery. <clears throat> the Wilmot Proviso in 1846 was a law that banned slavery in any of the territories that had been uh, accumulated or acquired from Mexico. It was a law, or it was a crisis, it didn't pass, it didn't get um, uh, fully implemented. The cotton gin, even though the cotton gin was uh, created or invented back in 18 or 1793, it didn't really get in use until about 1830. And between 1830 and 1850, production of cotton more than doubled. And because of the cotton gin, because of the ease of uh, taking care of cotton, they needed more production. And in order to get more production, they needed more slaves. And even though um, the slave trade from foreign countries had been um, banned uh, back in um, what, 1830? No, it was, it was before then. But still, the need for slave and inner uh, trade of slaves within the uh, country continued. And it ended up with the South having more of their financial resources tied up in slavery than the North had in industry. The amount of, of financial inv investment and slavery was absolutely fantastic. Uh, the Nat Turner Rebellion back in 1831, um, Southern, Southerners recognized that the Northern had groups of people who would try to incite slave riots. And Nat Turner back in uh, 1831 in Virginia got a group of slaves together and they en ended up killing 60 um, northern whites or southern whites and the south recognized that this could happen and we'll see again when we talk about john brown uh, how that influenced southern thinking and then of course the development of the underground railroad 
and uh, the escaping of slaves from, uh, from the South, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, also. Beginning in 1850, uh, tension between the two, uh, two areas began to increase. The Fugitive Slave Act, um, <clears throat> up until this point, in fact, up until 1864, Southern, uh, the government was pretty much controlled by Southern senators and, and uh, governors and so on. The Fugitive Slave Act required that Northerners would have to return any escaped slave. And that did not set well with many Northerners. And in fact, when uh, in Baltimore, when uh, they resisted uh, returning a slave to its owner, again, that created a lot of conflict. The Dred Scott decision, um, some people talk about the fact that the Dred Scott decision uh, on repealed the Missouri Compromise because a slave in a free state in Missouri was declared a non-citizen and therefore could not be freed and had to be returned to uh, his owner. Uncle Tom's Cabin, written in 1854, sold a million and a half copies. One of the very most popular books ever written. And uh, it raised awareness of the uh, horrific uh, condition of slavery. The Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, Kansas, when, when Kansas was acquired as part of the Louisiana Territory and so on, the um, Kansas-Nebraska Act that came up, would it be admitted as a free state or a slave state? And, um, oh, what's his name, um, Douglas, uh, Senator Douglas wanted it to be uh, what they called a, um, um, oh, let the voters in the state um, decide what it was going to become. And Missouri, the southern uh, border of Missouri, uh, border, they were called border ruffins moved into Kansas to make sure that the vote made it a slave state. Northerners sent all kinds of immigrants into Kansas to make sure it would be a, a free state. And it became a minor civil war back in 1854. Um, the town of, Lo of Lawrence in Kansas became a headquarters for the uh, abolitionists. And a Colonel Quantrell uh, with a group of uh, Southern soldiers or Southern guerrillas wiped out uh, Lawrence, Kansas. But it, it became a, a battle state. The Lincoln-Douglas debates. Lincoln, Lincoln really focused on, I can accept slavery where it is but I do not want it to extend beyond the current borders. And Douglas um, argued that slavery was fine wherever it existed. And that again raised controversy um, in, the, um, in the country. Tom Brown, I'll uh, talk about him a little bit later on. Lincoln's election, um, South Carolina seceded. Um, Soon after that, uh, seven states seceded, and then Fort Sumter. Lincoln, Lincoln sort of provoked um, the South, provoked um, the Confederacy around Fort Sumter. Um, the South had taken over a bunch of federal, fo uh, federal forts, federal property before that, down in Florida and in the Carolinas. But Sumter and Charleston Bay, uh, they wanted uh, them to surrender to the South. And Anderson, who was a colonel there, said, no, 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 I'm not going to surrender. And uh, there was some negotiation about the fact that the uh, government, uh, the federal government would turn over um, Sumter. And Lincoln said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do 
is announced that I'm going to supply Fort Sumter. And he said uh, I'm, I, publicly, I'm going to supply uh, Sumter because they're short on supplies. And when he did that, um, Jefferson Davis had given P.T. Beauregard permission to fire on Sumter. And so Lincoln went ahead and supplied it, and the South reacted and um, fired on Fort Sumter. Okay, um, the papers had a great time with cartoons, and uh, this happens to be a cartoon over the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, or the Democrats pushing slavery down the throats of the, the uh, Republicans in, uh, uh, over the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, they had their number of um, arguments in Congress, and this is a southern uh, senator um, beating up on a northern senator after he had made a speech uh, supporting abolitionists. And, um, uh, the southern senator beat him with a cane, and in the following month, the southern senator received barrelfuls of canes. <laughs> Uncle Tom's Cabin raised awareness of the difficulties or the, uh, the horrendous uh, condition of slavery, slave trades, the selling of slaves, the escaping of slaves, and uh, it, it well, it simply raised the awareness throughout, well, England particularly, and the North. John Brown, this is what he looked like. <laughs> John Brown, uh, after the um, uh, destruction of Lawrence, Kansas, he and his brothers, um, I hope I can pronounce it, Potawatomi, Potawatomi Creek uh, was a slaughter of five um, slave, uh, pro-slavers. And he, uh, after that, he was pretty much a wanted man. But he was going to uh, arm the slaves and create a slave rebellion. And he had six backers up in New England who provided him with money and support to arm the slaves. But he didn't want to arm them with guns. And he armed them with what are called pikes. And they're long uh, handled things with a knife on the end. And so he had 150 pikes. And he was going to go into the south and arm a bunch of slaves. And they were going to incite the slave rebellion. Well, he got as far as Harper's Ferry, where there was an arsenal, but he ended up not getting into the arsenal. He got into the firehouse, and in the firehouse, uh, it, they got sort of trapped in there. The townspeople in the Harper's Ferry took up um, uh, arms against him, and actually, Robert E. Lee, Colonel Robert E. Lee, was sent to put down the rebellion of, of John Brown, and he did. John Brown was uh, convicted of uh, treason and um, hanged. Frederick Douglass was a major force uh, leading the abolitionists at that period of time. Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was uh, rumored now, Harriet Tubman weighed 100 pounds. She was five feet tall. And when she was a teenager, she suffered a major accident, a, a blow on the head. And she suffered from narcolepsy and seizures. But the rumors are that Harriet Tubman helped 300 slaves escape from the uh, South into uh, basically Maryland. There are some authors who, uh, some historians who go into very exact records and they say actually it was 67. But um, I mean she became, she became a legend. 
Actually, uh, later on in the war, she led Union soldiers into some of the territories where she had been as a slave. Okay, Robert Lincoln's, or Lincoln's um, inaugural address. In the beginning, Lincoln was, um, his major focus was maintaining the Union. Um, he said, I can live with slavery where it exists. I do not want it to expand any further west. Um, the South felt that their rights were being violated because he was uh, advocating the limiting of slavery and would not allow it to be expanded. So in the beginning, preservation of the Union was the main focus of the war. Jeff Davis. Jeff Davis was a very wealthy slaveholder from Mississippi. He was a very intelligent man. Um, he, there, were, there, there was no electioneering in the South uh, like there was in the North. And he was simply drafted to become president of the Confederacy. His inaugural speech. God was on his side and God would win. Now, um, the, the, the main reason given for why the North won was the overwhelming numbers and resources that were available. Why would the South think that they could secede from the Union when the North had all of the people and all of the resources. Jefferson Davis felt that the determination of the southern people and the possibility that England and France would come on to their side once the supply of cotton had been cut off, that given their determination and foreign intervention, he felt we will prevail. Sumter was the one fact that um, um, motivated the North uh, to really get involved in, uh, in the uh, war. The, um, when Sumter, um, well, first of all, when um, Lincoln was uh, nominated, uh, South Carolina seceded immediately, and then shortly after that, uh, the seven deep South states uh, seceded, and then when Sumter was fired upon and fell, then um, four more states uh, seceded, so you ended up with 11 states uh, seceding uh, and becoming the, the, bait, the Confederacy. There were four states, um, Illinois, or Delaware, um, Maryland, Kentucky, and uh, Missouri that are called the border states. And uh, Kentucky, Kentucky um, declared itself neutral. Delaware almost went, um, or yeah, Maryland almost went, and Delaware almost went. But they, uh, again, the Union uh, population there uh, prevented them from seceding. Missouri was halfway, the southern half of Missouri was uh, pro-slavery, the northern half was um, pro-Union. When historians look back on the Civil War and they try to figure out why the South lost, they come up with all of these kinds of reasons. And rather than me going through talking about each one of these, I'm going to go through a series of pictures of different events that went on during the war, and I'll weave these in just to make it a little more interesting than having me standing here lecturing you. Thank heavens for that. Um, resources. 
railroads in the 1850s and railroads in the 1860s. The only problem with all these railroads in 1860 was that there were six different railroad gauges, six different um, sizes of tracks. And very often, traveling from one part of the country to another, you had to stop, get off one train, and get on another because of the different size gauge. So even though you had this uh, huge um, uh, complex of railroads, they weren't all that efficient. The North had huge advantages in resources. The Colt um, factory, eh, probably back in 18, eh, 1859 or so, suspected that a civil war was going to happen and they geared up like mad. And they, the Colt Manufacturing Company began producing all kinds of uh, armament. And that was typical of a number of northern industries. The first battle, the Battle of Bull Run, 18 miles uh, south of Washington, and people went out in their, with their picnic baskets and their uh, lorries to observe the battle. And they sat on top of a hilltop watching this battle uh, emerge. And in the first day, uh, the North pushed the South back like mad. The second day, Jackson came by with a trainload of soldiers. The blue lines, the blue lines show Union soldiers skedaddling back in every which way they could. It became sort of a um, melee. And in fact, the soldiers were having trouble uh, running past the uh, um, picnickers. Morale, morale went up and down. Morale was a function of individual battles. When one battle, when the North won it, everybody was happy in the North. When the South won one, everybody was happy. So morale went back and forth as a function of individual battles. Um, the North mobilized everything they could find. And this is a, uh, to, to start the um, blockade of the South. And this happened to be a, um, a tourist boat that very quickly got outfitted as a blockade um, uh, ship. Southern ingenuity was not uh, totally deficient. This was one of the first ironclads, and they raised a sunken northern ship and coated it with iron, and it became uh, an ironclad. Back at the first, the first, between the Monitor and the Merrimack off Hampton Roads uh, Harbor, um, two ironclad ships. The first, the first ironclad was a southern one, the Merrimack, which came out of the harbor and immediately sank two huge um, Union sailing vessels, wooden sailing vessels. And that changed the uh, whole tenor of what went on with uh, sea battles. The, um, <laughs> the Merrimack and the, and the uh, Monitor uh, fought for about four hours. They bumped into each other about seven times. They shot at each other constantly, but the cannonball simply bounced off their sides. And um, they retired after that, that they never saw each other again. Oh, this is Ball's Bluff. Um, and again, um, in the beginning, almost every battle was won by the South. And these are Union soldiers 
escaping into the um, Rappahannock River off Ball's Bluff. Okay, now, now we get to what I believe is one of the main reasons why the South lost the war. This is McClellan. McClellan was a klutz. Um, <clears throat> he was a Democrat and um, a wealthy, wealthy Democrat. And um, he, really, he really didn't want to get any of his soldiers hurt. Um, he, was, um, he was fantastic at organizing. And that's the reason that Lincoln uh, called upon him. And he wrote a letter back to his wife saying, I have been called upon to save the nation. And um, one of his first major acts was to move about 100,000 soldiers down to Fort Monroe at the bottom of what's called the peninsula. So um, McClellan has got this huge force down here. And McClellan had a propensity for always estimating that the South had three times as many soldiers as he had. So he was always overestimating uh, the number of soldiers, and he was always asking Lincoln to send him more soldiers. So, um, so McClellan is going up the peninsula. Um, he's got a few people ready to go. This is Fort Monroe beginning to build up. Um, this is what a convoy looks like as it's moving up the peninsula. And he comes to Yorktown. Yorktown is a fort, and there are about 40,000 soldiers in the fort at Yorktown. Um, McClellan has got over 100,000, but he said, I can't ta attack York. So he orders a siege, and he orders his siege guns brought in. Eight tons. Each siege gun weighs eight tons. It took him a month to get those siege guns from Mort Fort Monroe up to um, Yorktown, a month. At the end of a month, he was ready to begin his siege. The southern soldiers decided, we'll skedaddle. We'll get out of there. So they headed back to Richmond, and um, McClellan moved in, and um, The, the defender of, of um, it, it, it wasn't totally, they skedaddled. They, they had a few little battles. And um, the general in charge of uh, Yorktown um, got wounded. And at that point, Jefferson Davis, uh, Lee, Lee up until that point, Robert E. Lee had been an advisor to uh, Jeff, or, uh, Jeff Davis. And at that point, Jeff Davis gave Robert E. Lee command of the army. And if that, if that general had not been wounded at Yorktown, Lee would not have taken over, and the war might have ended right there. Um, McClellan might have been able to move in on Richmond at that point. Lee came in, Lee met with Jackson, Lee and Jackson. They sent McClellan scooting back off the peninsula, the Battle of Fair Oaks and um, um, a couple of other battles, and McClellan was gone. McClellan's next event, um, uh, Lee, Lee decided he was going to attack the north which was, again, one of Lee's major mistakes, and I'll get into that a little bit later on. But he moved into Maryland. He thought that because Maryland almost seceded, that he had a lot of Southern sympathy in the North. So he invaded Maryland and ended up uh, at Antietam. Now, three Union soldiers sitting out in the field found a package of cigars wrapped in a piece of paper. The paper happened to be Lee's plans for the attack 
on, at, at Antietam. The soldier sent the paper back to McClellan. He said, oh good, I've got all this news about what uh, Lee's going to do. What did he do with it? He sat on it. And he could have destroyed Lee at that point. He did nothing. The Battle of Antietam ended up being one of the bloodiest one-day battles in the Civil War. But Lee did not accomplish what he wanted to. He retreated back into uh, Virginia. That was the end of McClellan. Battle tactics, one of, one of the events. Every general in the Civil War followed Napoleon's Manual of Arms. And Napoleon's Manual of Arms meant that you massed a whole bunch of soldiers together and you attacked another bunch of soldiers. What the soldiers didn't really recognize, at the beginning of the war, artillery and armament became much more sophisticated. The old smooth, smooth bore uh, musket was accurate at about 50 yards. The new rifled barreled musket was accurate at 200 yards. A cannon, instead of shooting a solid cannonball, shot a grape shot, like a shotgun. And when you've got a mass of men moving up the hill and you've got grape shot firing at them, you wipe out a regiment in one shot. Battle tactics all massed together did not work anymore, but everybody stuck with it, except, oh, this is Burnside. We'll get, we'll, this is another joke. Um, <laughs> Fredericksburg. Um, actually, this, this wasn't all um, Burnside's fault. This is a Rappahannock. Burnside, coming down from the north, had ordered pontoons, pontoon bridges, to cross the Rappahannock. And Secretary of uh, the War, Halleck, did not really like Burnside, so he hesitated. If the, if the pontoons had gotten in place when Burnside wanted him, he could have crossed the Rappahannock before Lee got reinforcements. As it was, he was stuck over here for two weeks. By the time he crossed, Lee was heavily entrenched up here on what's called Mayor's Hill. Behind a stone wall up here, cannons up here, Burnside sent men up this hill, 17 battalions, wiped them all out. Major disaster. And uh, he retreated back across the Rappahannock. And um, at this point in the war, after a major battle, the two sides would go back to their camps and sit around for a while. Um, the war at this point was three days of intense battle and three months of sitting around in camp. And they sat around um, uh, all winter. They didn't fight during the winter time back then. Um, south on one side of the Rappahannock, the north on the other side, keeping track of each other. Eh, life was comfortable. You could bring your family along. Wife and kids, wife doing the washing and cooking. And then another joker came along. Hooker. Fighting Joe Hooker. And Hooker got the name Fighting Joe because of a misprint in the newspaper. The newspaper's report said, the Union Army still fighting, period. Joseph Hooker <coughs> takes over. They left off the period, and he became fighting Joe Hooker. <laughs> Joe Hooker was a, a womanizer, and he liked his drink. Because he was a womanizer, I wonder where the name Hooker <laughs> follows us.
Chancellorsville. Again, Hooker has got 120,000 men. He's moving south. Lee is sitting down there with about 30,000 men. All of a sudden, Hooker stops. He's, he's hesitating. He gets his men dug in. They're all dug in facing south with Lee's 30,000 men. One of the most brilliant moves in the war, Lee divides his uh, army in half. He sends Jackson around behind Hooker's army. General Howard actually saw Jackson's group moving, thought they were retreating. They wiped out the Union Army. They took off. Jackson, unfortunately for the South, Jackson was killed at this event. Um, on the second night of the battle, he went out to um, take a look at what was going on late at night. And as he came back, his own soldiers thought he would, it was a Union group coming back uh, to uh, scout them. They shot at him. They wounded him in the arm. Eleven days later, he died of pneumonia. Three major soldiers at the beginning of the war, Lee, Grant, and uh, Longstreet. They, they made a mess out of the Northern Army because we had three People like McClellan, Burnside, and Hooker. Three very inefficient uh, soldiers against three very efficient soldiers. And during the, at the beginning of the war, um, the S South was winning almost every battle. Now, Lee had a strategy that he didn't follow. His strategy was defensive. We'll fight a defensive war. They've got to come get us. The North was coming at them. Every battle, the South was dug in. The North was attacking them. And the North was lo making major, losing casualties like mad because uh, uh, the, the South had the inner ring easy to move, easy to can defend. The North was lost, losing every battle. Um, Gettysburg. Gettysburg is considered the turning point. The South was up north of Gettysburg. They attacked. Gettysburg went back into a defensive position. The North went back into a defensive position. And this is where Lee makes his first major mistake. The North was well entrenched along um, Cemetery Ridge. And down here on the bottom is little round top. Pickett's charge. Lee did exactly the same thing that um, Burnside did at Fredericksburg. He sent tons of troops up the hill toward a well-defended Union position. Now, if Lee had maintained his philosophy of defense of battling, <coughs> he might have been all right, but he lost a third of his army in this attack at Gettysburg simply because he became offensive. Now, another problem in this battle, well, and <laughs> this isn't a problem. <laughs> this is Chamberlain. Um, Chamberlain, the language professor from Bowdoin, Bowdoin College, um, who became a, a fantastic uh, leader in the Civil War. Longstreet, you remember, remember that hook of, of defense? Longstreet wanted to go down around um, Little Round Top and attack the flank of the Union defenses. If he had done that, he would have wiped out the Union Army defending on Cemetery Ridge. But General Lee said, I'm going to attack them where they are. And that's when he went up, when Pickett's charge went up the hill and got wiped out. 
Lee then retreated back into Virginia. He had a train of uh, 20 miles long of wagons going back to cross into Virginia. And Lincoln is saying, Meade, go get them, go get them. Meade said, my men are too tired. <laughs> Political um, conscript, uh, when, when most, most of the beginning, when, when, uh, <coughs> when Lincoln called for 75,000 men at the beginning of the war for 90 days uh, in, enlistment, uh, fantastic enlistment. Later on, he called for 300,000 men, 300,000 volunteers came in, no problem. Later on, it got to be a problem. They started conscripting soldiers, created riots in um, New York City, the conscript did. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln started it in um, 1862. But his uh, advisors, his cabinet said, no, no, no. It, it would be a very empty act. You need to wait until you get a victory. So after Antietam, he issued Emancipation Proclamation uh, that became effective January 1st of 1863. And that released um, black soldiers for enrollment in the army. And this is the first uh, regiment, uh, the 54th Regiment out of Massachusetts attacking Fort Wagner. Northern uh, leaders felt that they could not trust the black soldiers, they wouldn't fight, and Fort Wagner um, was attacked by a regiment of black soldiers. They fought famously, ended up with over 190,000 black soldiers joining the Union Army. Um, economic conditions, General uh, Jefferson Davis uh, did not raise taxes. He financed the war by printing money. Uh, inflation went up 9,000%. This is the bread riot in uh, Nashville that resulted from inflation. Inflation at 9,000%, everything became pretty expensive. Lincoln, on the other hand, raised taxes, taxes on everything. Um, Income tax, this is the first time that income tax appeared. 3% uh, on anybody who earned more than $800. Uh, th taxes and, and tariffs and was his way of financing the war. And then along came General Grant. And that changed everything. Because General Grant did not fight a battle and then retreat. His first war, first battle was the wilderness. And it was a battle. And it was sort of a stalemate. And Lee felt that Grant after that was going to retreat. They got back to officer's camp. And Grant said, get ready to attack the next day. That changed everything. There were no more rusting. Um, the wilderness uh, yeah, took off, went down to Chattanooga, uh, took over um, Missionary Ridge and Lookout Mountain. Okay, now the war changes. Um, Jefferson Davis is left with um, General Bragg and General Hood. Um, they were equal to McClellan and Burnside on the Union side to begin with. So now, now we've lost Jackson and Longstreet is um, out of it because its advice wasn't followed at Gettysburg. And so now on the north, we've got uh, Grant, Sherman, Tecumseh Sherman, and Phil Sheridan. Three very effective generals. And on the south, We've got Bragg and Hood, and they're worthless, but they were good buddies of Jefferson Davis, and he kept them on. Jefferson Davis would rather win an argument than win a battle. The Battle of Lookout Mountain, Battle Above the Clouds, 
Lookout Mountain. It's an interesting battle. And then uh, uh, Jefferson Davis went into conscription and he increased the age limits of the people that were being uh, required to fight. And the cartoon comes up robbing the cradle in the grave because he was getting younger and older people. Um, this is Phil Sheridan, who cleaned out the Shenandoah Valley. Um, <clears throat> when he got done with the Shenandoah Valley, he said a crow would have to pack a lunch to fly across the valley. This is Custer. Custer was sort of a flamboyant character. Shenandoah Valley. Tecumseh Sherman. When Sherman went to Atlanta. Now, this is the summer of 1864. Election coming up in November. If Lee had followed his strategy of defensive uh, fighting, holding out until the North got so fed up with the war that they would elect a Democratic peace president and they would, the South would gain their independence. If the election had been held in August of uh, 1864, Lincoln would have lost the election. And the Democrats, the peace Democrats would have won and a compromise would have been set up and the South would have won their independence. <clears throat> in October of 1864, Sherman, who had been marching south, was hung up around Atlanta. But in October, he captured Atlanta. And again, when I showed you morale changed with a function of individual battles, that changed the entire tenor of the North. When Sherman uh, took over um, Atlanta and Philip Sheridan had come down through the Shenandoah Valley, uh, things changed. Lincoln, as he's looking over his uh, possibility of being reelected, thought, well, it looks like I can get 177 electoral votes and there will be 140 electoral votes against me, given the current situation. One of the things he did was give all of his soldiers furloughs so that they could go back home to vote. And he ended up with 212 electoral votes to 26. So it did the re-election. But if Lee had stuck to his strategy of defensive fighting and waiting for the North to give up, he might very well have won his independence. Other historians have said, if Lincoln had been president of the South, the South would have won their independence. Lincoln was a master politician. Jefferson Davis argued with everybody. Tecumseh Sherman invented the concept of total war, destroyed everything in his path, down to Atlanta and then from Atlanta to Savannah, his march to the sea. Um, they figured that if war was fought based on not only the soldiers, but the backup behind them, so he destroyed the backup. They ran into Anderson Prison, that incensed the North and the soldiers. Um, Sherman, uh, Sherman took off from Atlanta without a supply line. <clears throat> and they looted everything. And this is a lady out behind bemoaning the fact, well, bemoaning the fact that uh, they're being looted entirely. Hood. Uh, tried to recoup Tennessee. He moved up on Nashville, was wiped out. Um, this is Hood. Uh, this, is, this is Bedford Forest. One of the things that the South had going for him was guerrilla warfare. And he had three cavalry um, brigades. Um, Stuart, Forrest and Morgan, and they were devastating because they could whoop in on a, on a group, raid, 
and take off with prisoners and supplies and so on. But Bedford Forrest was unique. Bedford Forrest enrolled in the army as a private and didn't like taking orders. He was a very wealthy landowner. So he went back home and formed his own cavalry unit. 1,500 men he outfitted with guns and horses. He hated blacks. When they attacked a, a fort, Fort Pillow, it's called the Massacre of Fort Pillow, they killed everybody even though they had surrendered. Uh, they killed them all. Cavalry raids, 1,500 men on horses. And from that point on, it was all downhill. After Hood lost in, in Tennessee, um, the South was routed, and then we come to Appomattox, whatever. <laughs> That's the end of it. Yes. You mentioned about the guerrilla warfare, and I was thinking about the revolution and how the, um, the Americans, the revolutionists, beat Britain by using guerrilla warfare, where they, the British would line up and shoot. And when you look at the art of this, it looks very much like the same thing, only they're both lining up. Yeah. Like they didn't learn anything. Yeah, right, yeah. They all followed Napoleon's Manual of Arms. And a mass of people against a mass of people was how you won the war. You had more mass. Yeah, you made an allusion to France and England and uh, the South, uh, the Confederacy's desire for them to enter the war. It seems as though at certain points in the war the country was weak. Why wouldn't a foreign country invade? Um, That's an interesting point. Um, Britain really didn't want to get involved. Well, OK, back up a little bit. The, the Union was an experiment in democracy. And England and France were both monarchies. And they were hoping that the democracy which was really a sense of the people ruling themselves, that democracy would fail because if it succeeded, that would have implications for the monarchy in both England and France. So they stayed out. Well, there was another problem too. Uh, England had, had abolished slavery in about 1820 or so. And yeah. so there was a significant amount of political discussion in England regarding what side they were going to go on if go on after, after the Emancipation Proclamation, it became obvious that it was a war for slavery. And England would not, having abolished slavery, would not get involved in supporting the South because it would be uh, ridiculous for them to support slavery. Yeah. Yeah. Also, England and France had never really been friends. <laughs> And so each was watching the other, and had one come out for the Confederacy, uh, the other would have thought that that was interfering and trying to establish a power base and would have reacted negatively. Yeah. Supposedly Russia is exhausted after the Crimea. So Russia, the other power, is exhausted after the Crimea, so they're not going to get involved. One of, one of McClellan's fame to claim, claim to fame, was the fact that he had, had observed the Crimean War and therefore was a, an expert. <laughs> yeah. I've been curious, what's your opinion about the punishment meted out to Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee? Do you feel it was fair? Do you feel that um, it's interesting that um, half of the Republican um, government became very upset with Lincoln when Lincoln announced his reconstruction plans as a very lenient kind of a plan. But that was Lincoln's position, that they were going to be lenient and be friendly, malice toward none, and bring the South back into the Union. So that was his position, and I, I agree with it. Yeah. The, the, the half, the, the, Radical Republicans wanted the South to be punished. 
and they drew up a, a platform and approached Lincoln with a platform when, they, when he came up with his reconstruction plan. And Lincoln, being the politician that he was, managed to get rid of it. Yeah. Since you've got that picture up, have you any thoughts on the way history is treated Grant and Lee? Uh, Grant's looked at by many as the butcher and he just threw men into battles and got them killed, but he didn't care because there was an almost unlimited supply to follow them up. Lee, on the other hand, was well, the marble man and uh, just so noble and all that sort of thing. Grant saved the Union the means to an end. And even though at the time Grant was considered a butcher um, because he did lose so many men, particularly when it came to Cold Harbor, Cold Harbor was almost a duplicate of Fredericksburg. And Grant apologized for it afterward, and, but he, he managed to win or to preserve the Union. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of, uh, I guess, sentimental of the South. And I think it's been by a lot of Southern rivals. <clears throat> Back in the 1930s, there's an area called the Revisionist. Southern writers who tried to make it out that the war was fought over liberty. States' rights. States' rights and liberty. Yeah. Preserve that way of life, but, but go back to the fact that all of their financial resources were tied up in slaves. If the slaves are freed, what happens? <laughs> they have to go to war. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, South Carolina voted to uh, secede, the uh, convention was held uh, at, down there, and 90% uh, of the people that were uh, represented at the convention were uh, slaveholders, and 60% uh, were uh, planters. Yeah. And the planters were to bind as anybody with uh, 20 slaves or more. So it was really about slavery uh, that they uh, voted, and then they were able to bring the rest of the people along with them after yeah. they yeah. Uh, voted to secede. Yeah, it, it, there's little doubt that slavery was a main issue of the Civil War. OK, yes? Yeah, the opening slide said the Confederacy lost, but my comment is that it's not over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Hey, you've been sitting long enough. Get up and move around. <laughs> hey. 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 Hey.